I said that there to too. anoint myself. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, this is amazing. I don't have to call it names or anything. You all are so quiet. <laughs> You're scaring me. All right, um, the outline should be passed out. So if you need one, Alicia has the extras over there. So grab one. It's always a pleasure to bring the word of God this morning. I'm very grateful to our pastor and elders for allowing me to utilize one of my gifts, so I appreciate that very much. As I brought to you last time, which was back in September, we're in a series. And the series is entitled, In Him, Our Life in Christ. Today I'll be bringing the second of the messages in this series to you. And uh, it's an important subject, I believe, because for one, it's very personal. It helped me uh, out of the pit of despair that I was in for a number of months after I had an accident on Lake Conroe with uh, my youngest daughter, Andrea, back in 2004. And as Pastor just mentioned, I think it's a relevant subject for this congregation, where we are as a congregation. Uh, a lot of people are in some hard places. And if we don't know where our life source is, um, it can be pretty overwhelming and deliver people to the pit of despair, as I'm well aware of where that lies and we need to not be in that place. In fact, it's God's will that we not be in that place as a believer in Christ. And so I think this series is important for us as a congregation as well. So I wanted to start this morning with just a brief overview of the first message that I brought to you uh, back about a month ago. Because it builds on each other. The first message builds on this message, and the message after this will build on it. So I want you to be clear in our understanding of where we've been and where we're going. The first message was entitled, Born Again. Born Again. In other words, these messages are to believers. Those that have been redeemed. Those that stand righteous before God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so if you're not in that position this morning, I implore you to seek out a way as far as the communication is in this body to communicate where you are and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because quite frankly, we seem to think we have life where I'm standing before you pretty much alive this morning in the body and the spirit. But unless we're drawing our life from the Spirit, the one who has redeemed us, we really will not know life. And so that's what this series is about, our life in Christ, knowing him. God has chosen to indwell us, to live his life through us, and to live as us to his glory. Now, it's preached a lot in the church that God is a, is a need meter. You know, we bring our needs to him, and he's here to bless us and do all kinds of things to make us better and, and to meet all of our needs. That's simply not the case that Ephesians talks about. Ephesians talks at length that we are to the praise of his glory. We are his inheritance. We are a element of the plan that he is working out, but we're not the center of the plan. The Son is. Jesus Christ is the center. Now, that doesn't mean that we get left out of all the blessings. In fact, Peter puts it that our promises are precious and magnificent. We get to participate in mind-blowing activity that God is up to living his life through you and I. But we're not the center of it. His Son is. And that's good news. I could sum up 
where we are this morning, much the same way that back in January of 1984, Wendy's uh, hamburger joint uh, published a wildly uh, popular ad. And it was an old lady driving around in a car with some other old ladies. And uh, she would turn to them and say, where's the beef? Where's the beef? Well, that's much the same way this morning. I'm asking, where's the life? Where's your life this morning? There's only two kinds of people in this world. Only two. You're either in Christ or you're in Adam. Sadly, the bulk of our populace is in Adam. It's the way we showed up in the fallen world. It's the inheritance we assumed from Adam and Eve. Fortunately, however, the gospel has been revealed and lived out through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ where if you are in Christ, you not only have his spirit, but we have his very life. And that's good news this morning. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, And the testimony is this, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It can't be any more clear than that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one will see life without the life of Jesus. It's not many religions, not many ways, not many paths. In fact, Jesus said it's a gate and it's a door. You enter it by faith. You live it by faith. You attain it by abiding in me. So we talked about this place called the eternal that we cannot see. It's every much as real as where I stand today with what I can feel, touch, taste, and interact with in the temporal realm. The eternal, the temporal. And Jesus talks a lot that he indicates that the eternal realm is actually more real than this place that we can see, touch, and taste, and interact with. He was constantly conveying that to the disciples, and they were always being confused by it because of the subject we're going to cover this morning. So the life is in a whom? It's in the person of Jesus Christ. I like what this one Bible scholar had to say about it. It's J. Sidlow Baxter, a British Bible teacher. He said, fundamentally, our Lord's message was himself. He did not come merely to preach a gospel. He himself is the, the gospel. He did not come merely to give bread. He said, I am the bread. He did not come merely to shed light. He said, I am the light. He did not come as a shepherd. He said, I am the shepherd. He did not merely come to point the way, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We set out to answer three questions in our original review of this subject. We set out to answer who is the life, where is the life, and who am I? And we answered those with the theme verse of Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. There's no other verse in the Bible that describes our life in Christ any more clearly than this. However, much like Nicodemus, when Jesus said and came and told him he had to be born again, he was as confused as many Christians are today as to who they are. Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said this to you. You must be born again. You must be born again. By faith. Faith as we described in Hebrews. The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction. The absolute certainty of things not 
seen. We enter through the gate, we enter by the door, and we are transformed. Jesus does an amazing thing that we reviewed in that first part of the series. So how can a Holy Spirit, how can a Holy God indwell me, an impure person, one that's separated from him? Well, the answer is plainly, as Scripture reveals with all believers, he transforms us. He converts us. He transplants a new spirit in you and I that can cohabitate with his Holy Spirit. In other words, I have to die. And that's what we told you or we reviewed in the first series. I have to die. He has to give me a new nature. He has to give me a new heart. He has to give me a new spirit that he can join himself to and live his life as himself through me and through you. Romans 6, 5 said, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Ezekiel 36 said, I will remove your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. One that I can mal be in and mal malleable. It can be shown to be of use to me. So we reviewed that we were dead to sin, the power of it, the law, and to myself as a point of reference. I love Romans from a theological doctrinal standpoint of giving the exposition in these areas. Romans chapter 6 for the death of sin in us. Romans chapter 7 for death of the law in us, doing the things right and wrong because now we are the fulfillment of the law. The lawgiver lives in us. And then what we're going to spend the rest of the time today on is myself as a point of reference. In other words, me trying to live up to some sort of standard that I think meets God's expectation or me trying to be religious or me trying to do right things or good things we're going to see very quickly that that can get us into a whole lot of problems if we're not careful. But I love the passages in Romans 8, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but it exemplifies now we have a power source that was not there before that we can draw not only the strength to live the Christian life from, but our very life itself. Romans 8, 4 said that in fulfillment of the law, we walk according to the spirit, not the flesh. The mind set on the flesh is death. The, the, the life set on the spirit is life and peace in Romans 8, 6. The spirit is our source of life. And if we're not drawing upon that, we will miss the life altogether. Romans 8, 14 and 6 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. In other words, Daddy, the creator of the universe, we can call Daddy in a personal, intimate setting. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Bible clearly alludes that a transformation has taken place, and that's what we reviewed in being born again. You are truly a new creation in Christ. One that didn't exist before when you showed up in the natural birthing process of how we got here. That person has died and you are now a new creation made in the image and the likeness and the fellowship of the Father and Jesus himself. This has transpired or occurred in our body, the one that I'm in right now, the my body, my soul, and my spirit. 
the Bible is clear that those are the three components that make up the totality of us. Most of us can relate to our body. That's what we're recognized as. And as we're well aware, it's not redeemed yet. It's wearing out. I have aches and pains that I didn't have yesterday. Or when I play Frisbee, I get a different pain in my elbow that I didn't observe the last game that I just played. The spirit is what we talked about in lesson one that has been transformed. You have a new spirit. The spirit, the divine spirit, joined to the Holy Spirit. And then what we're going to spend the rest of the day on today is the soul. The soul. Now, this term, as my wife has talked to me various times during this series, is a confusing term because... Songwriters have used the soul in the same context as the spirit or the heart or the new nature. But what the Bible uses and it is clearly positioned in 2 Thessalonians here is that the soul is our mind, will, and emotions. Now, don't get hung up on this def definition this morning because you can use it interactively when you're singing and, and that's fine with me. But as far as what we're going to study this morning... The soul that I will be talking about is our mind, will, and emotions. And if you're very cognizant and honest with yourself like I am, it's not regenerate yet. My emotions, my will, and my mind can be all over the place and not in sync with God's plan or his design or desires as where my spirit is. My spirit is fixed. It's always in tune with God because it was replaced by him. Now this is the story this morning that we want to fix our mind on. Is the difference between the soul and the spirit. Because this is where I got into issues after Andrea's accident. With all the emotions and all of the things that were going through my mind because of that event and the circumstances of life, if you draw your perspective from the wrong place, it'll drag you off into a place that's not desirable pretty quickly, and you will miss the life of Christ that you have in you. The Bible talks about sanctification. This is a theological term that means we are set apart for an intended purpose. It says it's the state of proper functioning. We are all being sanctified because of our relationship with our new spirit to Jesus Christ. Now there is a future sanctification that I'm looking forward to where the body, the soul, and the spirit will all be in sync with the Father. In other words, your body and soul will be regenerate one day. This comes from Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is your life, Again, who's your life? Jesus Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. First John, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm looking forward to the day where my body and my soul are in sync with my spirit. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved completely without blame at the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It speaks of the future sanctification of the promise of where we all will end up and where many of our saints are experiencing their total life right now in the presence of the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Everything has been transformed. But we go back to Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And I live that by faith. So what was crucified? Well, again, it was my flesh. It was my soul. I'm sorry, it was my spirit and my old nature. 
What was crucified was my spirit and my old nature that was wayward with God. And his life has replaced that with the new spirit. And as I said, we live that in our body and our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. We live by faith from who we are, which is our spirit, but it is housed in an earthly suit and in a place that has not be re been regenerate yet. In other words, my mind, will, and emotions have been swayed by what I've learned over my growing up as a child and as a young adult, and it's been swayed by my own propensity to be swayed by the sin of the world. That's why people that become Christians later in life, I believe like myself, have a diff more difficult time in yielding to the spirit because we've been trained in a lot of areas to respond by soulish activity or fleshly activity. Kids that grow up with the Lord at a young age usually don't have to face as many of those hurdles, but they can still face those. So the life I live now comes from Jesus. I live it by faith, and I live it from a place that's been changed in my inner spirit or inner being. We draw and we live from the resources of the Father and our Lord and Savior. This is exactly what Jesus did when he was here on the earth. In other words, he was human, but he was fully God. In other words, he had his mind, will, and emotions, but he also knew his deity as well. And he always operated that he never saw the consequences of life or the circumstances of life from an ultimate standpoint. In other words, when he saw the man's withered hand, he didn't go, well, you know, that's really too bad. I'm sorry you have a withered hand. It's going to be like that, and you may want to go see a doctor. No, he lived from the resources of the Father that the circumstances of life are not ultimate, and that's how we should be living. In other words, he looked at the withered hand and he said, but that's not God's will, and he healed him. He looked at the paralytic. He raised people from the dead. He had countless circumstances in Scripture where he saw that that was not the absolute of life that plays on the soul or our emotions. And that's the way we need to live from him in our emotions. So if you go to your outline this morning, it says, so what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? What's the difference between my mind, will, and emotions and the real me, the spirit me, the one that's been replaced by him, the one that's in total union with him? Well, it's very easy. Scripture says that, one, it is rest, rest. Jesus put it this way. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest. Rest. It's the difference between the noise of our emotions that go on the t all the time, being all stirred up, being anxious, being this, being that, and rest, rest, which I just read Jesus wants us to experience. He wants us to experience rest for our souls. When I'm trying to live for Jesus, and do all the things I know I should be doing or try to do or live up to or whatever it is, I am probably living in disobedience just like the nation of Israel did in Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience that Israel did. In other words, trying to be religious and trying to adopt this and adopt that, adopt all kinds of idols and other things to fulfill only a void that God can fill. 
Now, when I say rested from his works here, I'm not saying we are be, being lazy and not working, but it's the difference between a car that's run out of gas and you have a Samaritan come by and he puts gas in your car. It'd be like getting out of the car and getting behind the car and trying to push the car when the car has gas in it. The work we're talking about here is the cooperation with God to get in the car, turn the key, push the pedals, do all the gears and all of that kind of thing, and the car takes you on your merry way. You're still doing work, but it's in cooperation with him. So this subject, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? Our mind, will, and emotions, where most of us, and I am falling in the same category, live a lot of the time rather than the spirit me that's been replaced by God. Well, it's given in the truth of Scripture. This book that we study and we cherish and we esteem to, it's absolute truth. And this truth has power because the power couples to the power of your spirit that's been replaced, that's in complete union with the Father. Hebrews 4.12 puts it this way, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. In other words, the word of God, what we esteem to and what we read and what we memorize and study with at length is like a two-edged sword that cuts between our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, what we usually get all wrapped up in, and our spirit, what God says, what God dictates, how he wants us to experience rest, how he wants us to live, how he wants to experience his life, not the life of the mind and will and emotions or the soul. The soul is the great liar to all of us, our mind, will, and emotions. I don't know about you, but just take the emotions. Our emotions lie to us all the time. In fact, the soul is directly connected into the enemy's influence. The enemy can come in and plant a thought in your mind or give you an emotion and say, you know, you really deserve this because you're better than that or, you know, you really should take a revengeful thing for this person. They did this wrong to you. The mind, will, and emotions will get us wrapped up with our will into doing all kinds of harmful things and missing the life of Christ. Now that's where this term comes from this morning, the swing, the swing. I had good intentions this morning. I had an overhead prepared for you that illustrates the swing. But as I came in out of the rain this morning from the car, the Lord obviously said, no, you're not using that overhead anymore because all the raindrops had smudged it all the way in here. So we, we, we do not have the illustration this morning. But if you can imagine the swing as this. Imagine a swing set. It's a horizontal bar. And that horizontal bar represents the line that I talked about in the first message. The line between the eternal realm and the temporal realm, or this physical realm. And the spirit, our spirit, is fixed at the eternal realm's point on that line. Now, the Holy Spirit interacts in the same plane on that fixed point. But below that point is the temporal realm that we all interact with physically this morning. That is where the soul is, and that's where your body is. Your mind, will, and emotions are in the temporal realm, as well as your body. Your spirit is fixed in the eternal realm. So if you see the illustration, it's simply a swing. It swings back and forth. And if you imagine us as how we came here, eating from the tree of good and evil, we either have good to choose from or we have evil. 
And those mind, will, and emotions always swing between those. Things that are good or things that are not so good. And it's always swinging. Our mind, will, and emotions, the soul is always swinging. Now the tendency for us is to want to hinge that swing as it's swinging on the good side. In other words, nail up our emotions, mind, will, and all of those things that we don't like, that we often do, to the good side. We can nail that up there and then we'll be fine. And for a while, some of us can do that. And then something comes along that reveals that that is not the case. And I'm living from myself. I'm living from the wrong place. I actually had this experience um, Saturday night. Alicia and I went downtown to listen to the Houston Symphony because our daughter had tickets and she gave them to us. And um, the Lord always does this when I preach a message. He says, oh, really? Oh, really, Jeff? And so we had this Houston Symphony and enjoyed that. And we got out fairly late, about 1130, as you recall. And for some reason, all around Jones Hall, they have all the streets that lead to I-45 blocked off. I'm like, really? Why is that? But I wasn't saying it calmly like this. <laughs> and as we started traversing the streets, we put on the, the GPS, and the GPS now was just turning us in circles, around and around and around downtown in circles, trying to get on a ramp that doesn't exist. So I turned off the GPS, now I'm on my own. I've got this handle. I'm whizzing through the streets. I'm going this way, going that way. And eventually now we end up down by Minute Maid Park. And guess what? Game six is releasing out of Minute Maid. Now I'm in traffic beyond my wildest imagination when all I wanted to do was get on the on-ramp of I-45. Well, needless to say, my wife was now speaking in tongues. <laughs> I was having a complete fit. And the Holy Spirit, and the spirit part of me was saying, Jeff, it's nice you're talking about the soul this Sunday. <laughs> Our mind, will, and emotions can lead us astray so quickly, we don't even have to think about it. We don't even have to think about it. And it's because we somehow get in our own minds that yeah, God is nice, and I'll come to him when I need to. But yeah, I've got a lot of areas that I can pretty much rule and run on my own. It's this particular story that made an impact on me that kind of illustrates this. A young man was on his way one day to visit his farmer friend out in the farm. And he ended up entering the farm and began to meander on a road that went by a barn. And on the barn was some targets where someone had been practicing their marksmanship. And he was amazed because every single target had an exact bullseye. And he thought, this guy is really a great marksman. And so he finally caught up to the house and he went in and he talked to his friend John. He said, John, I never knew you were such a good uh, shooter. And John said... He kind of laughed and he said, no, no, no. What I did is I shot the barn and then I went back and I drew the bullseye around him. <laughs> That's exactly how most of us live our lives in the soul. We look good. We talk good. We carry our Bibles. We're able to quote some verses. We're able to do some pretty good works. But it's us. It's you and I. It's the soul. It's the one that's down here swinging back and forth, swinging back and forth. We've just nailed it up on the good side for a while. We're not drawing our life from the life giver. And at some point, the Lord will reveal that you are not able to live the Christian life. You need me. There's only one life that was lived that matches up to my life, and it was Jesus Christ. But he's in you. That's good news. Draw from him.
So the soul and spirit, as I said there, are divided by the word. The word of God will divide the soul and spirit activity for you. If you're, always, if you're ever confused or always confused about this, go to the word. The word is dividing a double-edged sword that will separate the sword or the word. It will separate the soul and the spirit, just like it does marrow and bone. There's another danger that comes from this in your outline there. It's where I put, we start believing we have two natures. Two natures. As I said, how can a holy God inhabit me, an, own, an unholy person? Well, he has to do some radical surgery. He has to replace my heart. He has to replace my spirit. And that's just exactly what he did. He didn't come in and inhabit my fallen nature with a new nature. And that's where we get some of these things thinking we have a new nature because your mind, will, and emotions, you will feel at times because of the things you do or the things you think, there's a good bad, there's a good dog, and there's a bad dog in you. And if I feed the good dog, I probably will become better. There is not a good dog, bad dog in you. If you're a believer here this morning, there's only the new nature. You have a new nature, a new spirit. But your mind, will, and emotions, and the enemy will sometimes use that to make us think that we are two natures. So it's drawing our identity from feelings. It's drawing our identity from what others say about us. It's drawing our identity from a host of other activities in our world that go on that define who we are or who we're not, rather than eating from the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ himself. Nailing the good side of the peg on the good side of the swing may be good, but it's not always God. And so we always have to go back to him at the point of fixation in our spirit that is Jesus Christ. Now as I indicated, Romans 8 has a lot to say about this now that we have the new engine implanted in our lives. Paul talks mainly about the flesh as the soul. The fluctuations of the flesh are being fleshly. He says in Galatians 5.24 and 25, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, they have killed, they have exterminated the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Are you with me here? It's a drawing of our life from the power source that God has implanted in us. From the spirit you, the real you. And as I've spent countless years, and I still do at times like Saturday night, I get ticked off or I get wrapped up in my emotions about something, and before you know it, I am headed down a path of no return that I really didn't want to start on and really has no good consequences. In fact, it says, if you live by the flesh, you must die. That's a scary verse. If you live by the flesh, you must die. In other words, God's going to put a lot of things in your life to point out your fleshliness, and you haven't crucified it. And he will. And some of those things are not pleasant. I've experienced some of those things. Being fired from a job and being uh, all in uh, consternation with workers and all kinds of things go on because of the flesh. So what makes this so hard to follow the spirit? What makes it so hard? Well, it's because we were made this way. God didn't take our humanity away when he gave you his spirit. It's the noise of our emotions. It's living in two places at the same time, like I explained to you. I put in your outline there, the soul is a hurricane. 
The best description of it is a hurricane. We're all familiar with hurricanes this year. We had Harvey and then we had Maria and we had a bunch of series of other storms that came through. The soul is a hurricane. The spirit or the fixed part of you, the new you, the new creation you is fixed. It's the I. It's calm. It's, there's no noise. There's no ruckus going on. The soul, the mind, will, and emotions, it's the eye wall of the hurricane. So as you leave the center of it, or the eye, you're immediately faced with the eye wall of the hurricane. 180 mile an hour winds or less. That's our emotions. Most of the time, for most of us, getting all wrapped up and agitated about all kinds of stuff, either that the enemy's created or he thinks that he'll get a rise out of you. And he usually can. And then the body is our container for all of this, and it's just kind of the outer bands that are swinging around all of it. And uh, eventually, you know, they calm down either by their own initiative from the spirit or they continue to swirl because of the soul. God made you the way you are, so we are not an, a liability to him. We are an asset to him. But the enemy wants us to make us aware that once we've received Jesus Christ, now we're a liability to him because of all this soulish stuff and fleshly stuff that goes on in our life. The Lord made our humanity the way you are and the way you perform and, and function for a reason. For one, it's how we operate by faith. How could we operate by faith if we didn't have this soulish activity that persuaded us not to be that way? And then the other reason is that he made us unique, every one of us, in our own sense because he's using you in a particular station of life where he's placed you before the foundation of the world to reach people for him and to glorify his name. So in your uniqueness, that's a good thing because there's only one of you that can reach others in your place and your station. So the swing is just going to swing. We're going to swing from now until we get to the eternal realm. Our emotions, our mind and will are just going to swing. But if you know the difference between them and the spirit you, the fixed you, the quiet you, you will be able to draw upon the quiet you and his life and the soul will comply and fall into line. It's knowing him, knowing the spirit, knowing the life that resides in us in Christ. It's the tree of life, the singular, where we started out before the fall. Adam and Eve walked with God in the coolness of the day. He's wooing us back to that relationship. It's knowing the tree of life and not the swings of the soul. We learn to live by faith. We make, we make, or to make me know, to make me know that I have died to me and my effort, my performance, my painting my target around the bullseye, and that I would know that Jesus is my savior and my life joined to my spirit. This is not just a no in the Greek term of knowledge, of data gathering, of knowing something about something. The Bible's use of this word no is a Greek term called epikenosis. Epikenosis means an intimate knowledge. This is the term used for a husband and wife relationship, knowing a person of experience that way. We are to know Jesus and our Savior in an epikenosis way, and he wants us to know him that way. 
Ephesians 3, 16 through 19 says that, says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man or woman, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. Paul runs out of terms to express it. And to know epikenosis, the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. That's pretty good stuff, is it not? To be filled up with him, since he is the life and knowing it in our soul, knowing it in our mind, will, and emotions right now that have not been fully converted. We are to live out the full grace of him, living out our union with him, and eating from the tree of life, not the tree of good and evil, which our soul often partakes of. There is no condemnation for the believer. And we need to order our soul in acknowledging that. God no longer condemns us, neither should your mind, will, and emotions. And oftentimes believers are beaten down and live defeated lives because they're condemning themselves for either something they've done, continue to do, or afraid they will do. We are under no condemnation. So we, in our soul, should not condemn us. As long as we live in the soul, as long as our humanity is our point of reference, we don't know him. We don't epikenosis him. We won't experience him. We validate God from our spirit and not from our soul. We live and draw our life from a place of perfect stillness where all is simply is. Where we know, we know. And if we don't, we will miss him. I'm going to close with this story this morning. Bob read it from the story of Elijah. It's a perfect illustration of a man of God, a mighty man of God. This guy said, I'm going to tell you something. It won't rain until I say so. You know what? It didn't rain for three years. This is a guy that's totally in tune with the Lord. Yet, he was perfectly human and had a lot of soul activity going on. He was my soul man. I was going to sing that this morning, but I didn't want to have a mass exodus, so. <laughs> I do want to read a paraphrase, though, of this story that uh, Bob read that's kind of humorous and I want to read this and then I'll close with the aspects of not only the key points of this story but our application from the second message it says that that night King Ahab went back home to the castle with to his wife the evil Queen Jezebel it was the maid's day off and Jezzy was in the kitchen tossing a salad she was up to her elbows in lettuce and carrots and peppers, and she was preparing a special Jesse's juice for dressing. Ahab walked in and said, Jesse, you should have been at a revival today. You know, I have everything to do, or I, have, I don't have anything to do with your religion. She kept on working the salad. You would have been surprised beyond belief today, he replied. It was amazing. And he told her about the contest. I'm not interested in your religion, Ahab. I've got my own gods. I've got my own preachers. He answered, well, I want to tell you something about that. I believe you are preacherless. 
Because after the contest was over, Elijah took all of your preachers, all 450 of them, down to the brook, and he killed them. What did you say? All your preachers are dead. Jezebel started picking the lettuce off her hands slowly. She instructed Ahab, go in my office and get me a piece of my royal stationery. Get me the royal pen and the royal ink. I'm going to write a royal letter. Ahab, the hen-pecked husband, ran and got the royal paper, pen, and ink and brought them to her. Jezebel wrote one sentence. By this time tomorrow, you're going to be as dead as all of my preachers. Guess who she was delivering that to? She folded it and sealed it with the royal seal and said, Take this out to Elijah. He's sitting out there in the town square with all those other wise guys. Take that to him. So Elijah got the letter, and this fearless man of God stood up and said, I'll face her. I'm not afraid of her. I'll meet her tomorrow, and she won't kill me. God is going to triumph. Nah, wrong. So Elijah got the letter, and this fearless man of God stood up and said, I'll get out of here. I'm done. He said, it's time for my annual vacation, and I'll take it without pay. He didn't even wait around for the treasurer's check. He lit out and he ran. The Bible said he was afraid, and he feared for his life, and he ran from her. This sound like the circumstances in our life? Everything's going along smoothly, and something comes up, stirs an emotion. Ah! Ah! And we react. We're down the path somewhere. We don't know where we're going, but we're reacting. So I love the rest of this story. Let me go back to the text within the Bible of this because I want it accurate. Within 1 Kings here. This is a fascinating story because Elijah was a man of God, but he was stirred by his emotions. And stirred by his emotions, he ran off. Yet God didn't abandon him. In fact, it said he sent the angels, two of them, in fact. And they provided for all his needs. So while we're running down the path to a mess, God is still going to provide to you and to me. In the mess, he's going to provide, even though we've made a mess of it. He changes the messes to a blessing. But Elijah didn't know the difference between his feelings and his God, the Spirit. So God is going to point him to a lesson here. And he came there to a cave and he lodged there and behold the word of the Lord came to him and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? This similar question that God asked Adam and Eve. Who told you you were naked? It's not that God lacks information. He wants us to realize the waywardness of our ways. I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, sons of Israel, forsaken thy covenant, torn down thine altars, and killed thy prophets with thy sword. And I alone am left, and I, they are seeking my life to take it. Ah, wah, wah, wah. You know, I don't believe, Lord, you have a plan here. I'm just... Reacting off the circumstances. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great strong wind was rendering the mountains and breaking into pieces the rocks before the Lord. You talk about a hurricane. This hurricane's breaking the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And it came about when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in, the, in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. In other words, he knew who this was. And a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah, again? And then he has... 
the same response, and he goes on and tells the Lord of how he doesn't have a plan until the Lord says, yes, I do have a plan. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, Elijah, <clears throat> I'm a sovereign God. I have a plan for you. I have a plan for what's going on. What you're missing is me because of your emotions and exactly what was sent to get his attention. The hurricane, the earthquake, and the fire. And the Lord says, I was not in them. I allow them, but I was not in them. It's the same way with our lives, with the circumstances of our life. I don't know what's going to happen this next week. Some circumstance will roll through that your emotions are going to react to. But if you live your emotions, you live your soul, you will miss him. And that's exactly what God was telling Elijah. Keep your focus on me, even though your emotions are going crazy, and you will experience rest. You will experience peace. You will experience the abundant life that Jesus talked about. It doesn't change your circumstances. It doesn't change maybe how your soul is feeling. But it will change how your perspective of life is. You will experience him. You will know him. You will epikenosis him. <laughs> so we're does this leave us this morning? Knowing that our mind, will, and emotions, the soul lie to us and they just swing. They're going to continue to swing. So you can't nail them up on the good side. They're going to continue to swing. But the soul noise is not real. It's only noise. God's spirit is the gentle blowing in your inner spirit, knowing his presence that we just talked about. How do we know him? Well, we came to faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you got the life. How do you live in him? By faith in Jesus Christ, abiding in vine Jesus. It's the assurance of things hoped for, and it's the conviction of things not seen. By revelation, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you life. By revelation, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you your rest and peace from the inner man or woman. By the revelation of the Holy Spirit, you will experience true life. And that's what he wants. He wants us to be filled up to the fullness of him. May we experience him this next week. Coming in message three will be some practical aspects of how we accomplish this in the soul to be aligned with the spirit. And we're going to be talking about that from the book of Peter, Second Peter. So if you want to look at the first part of Second Peter, that's where we're headed, and it'll be great. It'll be wonderful because he will reveal how, in a practical term, we apply what we've learned these last two sessions. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us a new spirit, a new nature. We are new creations in you. Father, we are joined one with you to Jesus the Son and God the Father. Father, we have the ability, we have the power, we have your mind to orchestrate life in us. May we draw that life from your spirit. Father, may we just know the difference this morning between the mind, will, and emotions of our soul and the quietness of that spirit that gives us your life. May we draw life from you 
and may we abide in you that we would be to your glory and that we would be of use and useful in your kingdom. Father, I pray that you'll enlighten our minds this next week as we live through circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we always do, if you would like prayer or you would like just for us to love on you, you come forward and we would be happy to do that.